Hello, and welcome to Read Scholars Live. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Fleming, the current president of Read Scholars. Today, I am joined by Sarah Verbeest, who is the co-principal director for the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Hi, how are you? Hi, great. It's such an honor to be able to be in a conversation with you this afternoon. Thank you so much. I'm excited to speak with you as well. Uh, so how does this July find you? How are things on your end? I feel like we're kind of um, all around here taking a bit of a pause. Um, and I think looking at my team and my colleagues, I think, you know, we all kind of came into the summer realizing how low battery we mm. were. Yes. And so just, you know, a time for recharge, not working on weekends, you know, trying to right size the job, maybe take long weekends. It's been good. And I'm starting to see people starting to kind of look like they used to look. So I think uh, just trying to, to take the summer, it's super hot here in North Carolina. So, you know, Southern summers do kind of make you slow down a little bit naturally. True. Yeah. Very good. I, that's so funny you say that. So I was talking to one of our mutual friends, Pia, uh, earlier today, and I have been encouraging her to take some time off. And she told me today, she's like, I scheduled off time this summer so that I could actually relax and recharge. So um, it's funny that you said that today. Um, so tell us a little bit, let's just kind of start about your journey in health equity and maternal child health and kind of either did they come together? Did one of them come first? And then maybe give us the, I'm sure it's a long story because you wear many hats, but give us kind of your trajectory up into to what brought you to the Innovation Center now. Sure. Let's see. So I will say I've always been a feminist. I grew up a preacher's kid um, and was always a little grumpy about the lack of um, female lead characters in the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I always asked questions about why do we have to gender God if, you know, um, super popular, obviously, comments in my family <laughs> growing up. <laughs> You've been ruffling feathers from way back. I like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, that was um, sort of my identity as a uh, female um, and thinking about that rights has has always been really important to me and um, our well-being and role that we can play. Um, I did my um, graduate internship. Well, I, I lived overseas and then I did my graduate internship work um, in Calcutta and had always thought I was just going to come to Chapel Hill, get my master's degree and go back and continue working internationally. And I realized um, after that internship that there was no way that I could understand the complexities within another society if I couldn't even understand the complexities of race and identity in my own. And so um, that was a big life pivot decision from where I thought I was going to um, changing and staying put and starting this journey of really learning and understanding. Um, and I think for me, it was really understanding the intersectionality um, with feminism and black feminism. Um, and I think also now I've really in loved what our students are bringing in terms of really diversity and gender expression. And I think that's a really powerful place of learning and opportunity for all of us. So I think um, it's, it's, it, I think our understanding of our identity, our lens and of equity, it's a process. <laughs> Um, and unseeing, unseeing things and seeing things is just a constant everyday waking up. And for me, I think it's a, a blessing of a journey mm -hmm. because I am finding more and more that our liberation is tied up together. Um, and I think, um, uh, I had a little time off like in March and I, um, was in the mountains and I brought this book. It's by uh, Sonia Renee Taylor it's called The Body is Not an Apology. Oh, I like it. And I completely freaked out over that book. I'm like, this is life changing. <laughs> and, um, and it really was um, because it also, she talks about these identities around also aging mm. and um, uh, things around um, fat phobia and weight and ability. And it just really just, it's so much of this is tied up together. 
yeah. and our ability to understand what is equity and what is health justice. So I think that's maybe a long answer to your question. No, but that's great. I think, I mean, I, I definitely track with you around kind of the evolution of identity and like understanding our own identity so that we can understand how other people are interacting with theirs. And I went to Kenya um, almost three years ago now. It seems not seems like it shouldn't be that long ago. But anyway, under, like understanding myself through the lens of being an American and a Black American in an African country um, in East Africa. Yeah, so it was, it's a lot of complexities and, 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 I ha- and some of that, I, I was expecting a little bit of it. Like I was expecting to have some reflection and, and some introspection, but it was a little bit more um, than I thought I would have, especially mm-hmm. because of my skin color. Um, they quite didn't understand why I identified as black, right? And so those conversations were very interesting and, and eye-opening and, and, um, and, and I brought home a lot of reflection from that. Um, so, and you know, and you particularly work in an academic setting with students, you know, and, and that's usually the age in which we are evolving the most around identity. Um, talk a little bit about uh, why you, you you told us you came back to academics and you thought you were going to go off and trips around the world, but um, why you tried decided to stay and what um, particularly drew you to this position? Sure. Um, I think, well, my first, um, I haven't had many jobs, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I found so many different ways to innovate within the positions I've had. So um, my first seven years, I worked for the March of Dimes and I was um, there. I had a chance to um, manage programs and grants, but also became a lobbyist and really got turned on to what it means to do advocacy and address policy um, and did a fair bit of communications as well. So that's the great thing when you can get a job at a nonprofit that you get to hone and build so many skills. Um, And then I had the chance to come to UNC as the executive director for the Center for Maternal and Infant Health. And that was in the School of Medicine, and it's a partnership between the OBGYN department and pediatrics. And um, that was an interesting thing as a a public health person and a maternal child health person. A lot of that work was basically tertiary prevention. Like we were working with the sickest of the sick. And so it took me about 15 years to kind of slowly build out that portfolio so that now we are running like our state safe sleep campaign and our state tobacco cessation campaign. Um, And so, um, and then I still keep that hat on and I am now faculty in the school of social work and I direct the Jordan Institute for families, which has allowed us to kind of expand from just um, to look at family units and thinking about more complexity of early childhood and family development. So the thing to know about me is in academics, there's kind of a certain way you're either research and you teach, and then there's those of us that are the entrepreneurs in the system. (laughs) (laughs) And so that's why it's always hard to describe what I do because I just find ways to make it happen and find ways to build collaborations and um, to do the work that I think we should do as a state university to be serving the people and moms and babies of our state. Um, So um, that's just kind of a little snapshot. And um, since I've been at social work, I've had a chance to teach um, and our students are amazing and they do, they challenge us um, and push us. And I feel like I'm often a shared learner with them in the process. Um, And um, I teach administration and management, for example, and just the importance of continuing to learn. If anyone takes nothing away from this thread, it's like we have to always keep learning and be humble, 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 that we only know today what we know today. And so every time I prepare for this class, I'm pulling out all these new books because I'm trying to bring in different voices and perspectives on management and leadership and team building and crucial conversations, right? So a lot of the books on crucial conversations are by white men. So how does one have a crucial conversation when you have a different identity, a minoritized identity in an organization or at a negotiating table? So one one year, my students and I, we just totally unpacked crucial conversations and like wrote a rebuttal (laughs) to the authors. Now, though, I'm trying to find more of that engagement from the voices of other people to bring in this space. So that was a very roundabout answer to your question. I want to ask two follow-ups. One, for those who are, 
you know, not as versed in maternal child health um, in our audience. In, in talking about innovation and, and intersectionality, not of identity, but in between medicine, public health, and social work, um, as we kind of talk about the social determinants of health kind of underlying all of those things. Can you give us just an example of, because um, you were talking about like the tertiary uh, triage versus like an upstream interventions, but can you just kind of tie that all together for people so that they know sure. what those mean uh, when they're yeah. listening? Absolutely. So um, I'm just going to give an example of um, some different services that would define that, right? So um, when I'm talking about tertiary prevention, that's basically when people are already sick, really sick, how we make that better. So in terms of providing comprehensive services and support um, and to some, a family that's pregnant with a baby that has very complex anomalies, you know, we can't fix those anomalies or keep them from happening, but we can really help get the best possible outcome for that family in a way that makes them feel seen and heard and, and sets the best possible life force trajectory. So that would be tertiary. Um, if we were gonna kind of step um, kind of down the thread, you know, depending, there may be, have been some things that we might have been able to do to prevent that birth defect from developing. So for example, um, spina bifida is um, a neural tube defect where the baby's spine doesn't completely close. And some of that is preventable if um, a, a birthing per a person before they become pregnant is taking folic acid. Right. And so that is where we're thinking more primary prevention. What are some things that we can do to help prevent um, to prevent disease or sickness. And so um, we now are both providing this complex care, but also um, doing things like how to, how to help babies sleep safer, um, um, how to prepare for pregnancy, what are some things that one should know, um, how to address tobacco cessation, which has intergenerational impacts. Does that make sense? So working at those different levels, um, and I think it's important to work at all of them, but ideally we are investing in that primary prevention or trying to catch something earlier in its stages, as opposed to waiting, like our healthcare, healthcare system, which really we like to treat sickness and we don't want to invest in kind of earlier um, in that wellness continuum. Exactly. And, and we could have a whole conversation about the healthcare system and reimbursement and why things are reimbursed the way they are and why prevention is not high on the uh, priority list, but that's for another day. <laughs> that system has to go, but we, that is like a whole other conversation. All but other conversation. I, at some point, it's like, how much do you tinker with it and how much do you just... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, but... Next um, <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that one. My second question was um, a follow up to the crucial conversations part. So one of the interesting things out of, you know, 2020 and now early 2021, I uh, was looking at COVID and um, the uh, inequities and justices, depends on which word you want to use around uh, uh, how COVID was transmitted and treated and vaccinated, right? We can go down the trajectory. And also thinking about the social justice things that happened last year with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And of course we could list many more, um, but we have seen a reaction in, in that both academics and in corporate America um, saying that they wanna address health equity um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so you've seen a lot of these jobs popping up with these offices, right? And a lot of these offices are not really offices. It's just one single person with this title. Um, mm -hmm. And the leadership in the organization is still very homogeneous, right? Um, so think about, or if you have any kind of reflections or um, comments on how to deal with that dynamic or any advice for people who find themselves in, in those positions um, or anything along that line? Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of thoughts, you know, some are at kind of an interpersonal level and some a little bit more organizational. Um, so I'm gonna just speak from my identity as a person who identifies as white. Um, and kind of where I've seen my role around these crucial conversations. So first and foremost, back to my theme of keep learning. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so there are so many good programs online that you can listen to. I, Loretta Ross, who's a goddess, um, did a series of just conversations. So like 700 people and she would just get on zoom and like talk for three hours and it was phenomenal. Right. And just, so I just absorbed. And so, so we have to take the time to learn and understand before we just go off and open our mouths and think we know what we're talking about. So just wanted to reiterate that. And then I think, you know, I've see my role also is starting an uncomfortable conversation Mm -hmm. or calling something out and noticing I'm like, well, who is missing in this conversation? Have we talked to, have we talked to these folks before we think that this is a good idea? You know, do we really understand the problem that we want to address? Um, are we being respectful? How do we get feedback loops and starting to just call the question? Um, and, um, know that I don't always have the answers and we as a group don't have it may not always have the answer, but that's not enough. (laughs) So you start the conversation and then you figure out how you're going to find some strategies um, so that we're not being performative. We're, we're truly moving into allyship. Um, But it starts with that conversation. And sometimes that uncomfortable looking around the zoom and being like, "Eh, we're all white. (laughs) So who does, who needs to come onto this team? And are we in a place to fully step back and, you know, follow their lead with what we think needs to do. So I think there's that. I've also learned that we have to be on, we have to be comfortable with discomfort around racial discord and conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I am a preacher's kid and I'm a social worker and I'm a female. So I like everyone to be okay and get along. And like, (laughs) I mean, I think I've invested a lot of energy in that in my life. And to understand that it's just sometimes it's going to be painful and uncomfortable and that doesn't make me a bad person or that a bad conversation, but we have to be able to hold space for that. And um, so that has been another important learning (laughs) for me um, around, again, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, And I think that the more that one does the work and gets in these situations, you get more, it, it, you become better at that. And then your brain stops having all these emotional reactions and you really open up to, Oh, I see this way forward. Um, I think in terms of organizations, I think we just have to call out people that are being performative. It's impossible to have one individual be responsible for culture change in an organization. It's culture change. Um, And I think that there are different levers that we can work. I think that, um, Again, not being able to change the whole organization isn't an excuse for not getting started. Right. I think it's also where do we find some places that we can move? And there are lots of organizations that are um, coming out with like readiness assessments or kind of where is your organization on this scale? And so I think kind of being honest with where you are and you can do that without having everyone buy in and then decide where are there places we could move? Is the HR department in a place where they're really ready to think about different hiring? How, what can we do there? Are we ready to look at performance assessments? Can we do a performance or review assessment? And are people being reviewed fairly and equitably? Are they paid equitably? Is this a place we can work? Can we look at our vendors at least? You know, <laughs> Can we look at the images we use on our website? Like, Where can we start? But understanding that it's part of a bigger journey that we need to be um, creating. Um, and I think that for organizations that, that want to be different, um, building plans with accountability in them and also some short-term wins or strategy so that you can show that you're making progress is very important. Um, and I, I don't think, I, I don't know if I could say that I'm company, but I was reading on my phone and one organization that I happened to buy sports clothes from um, actually followed up and, and did this whole report back on their strategies for creating equity. I was so impressed. They did a review of their pay. They um, looked at their hiring. They looked at their models. They looked at the new designers to design the clothes. They looked at community grants they were giving to two community folks to support movement and activity and it just kind of went on and I was like, wow, this is awesome. This is concrete. Um, their commitment to help at all sizes by what they offer. And it's true. You can see it in their products. And I think that's really what organizations mm-hmm. need to be aiming for. Um, 
over time. But it's just, if anyone has just that lone person and you're listening to me right now, first of all, friend them, support them, um, ally with them, um, build allyship around them, um, do your job, do your own part yes. to help that person. Definitely. I, I, um, I got several takeaways from that one. Um, change is uncomfortable and these kind of conversations can be uncomfortable and that's okay. Um, and then change doesn't have to come all at once. We just got to start somewhere and that it's possible. There are examples like you gave that are um, really show that when you are committed to it, you can make it happen. Um, and three, that we're all in this together from your earlier statement. Um, uh, you know, our, our identities are intertwined and our freedom is intertwined. And so if we leave out a whole chunk of people, that's really pulling us down too, right? So we got to all pull ourselves up together. Um, yeah. Well, and I'll just say for that one organization, you've got to know their bottom line is improved because they've expanded who's going to buy their clothes and products and right. feel good in them. So I guess, you know, it's, it's, it's transformative. I think what I like, this is exciting work. This is great work. It's like creating space for so many new ideas and approaches and ways of thinking um, to our work. And I think also like relearning our history, you can either look at it as I'm not going to believe this or it's hard, or you can look at it from a point of, well, now that really does make sense to me yeah. because that, and so I think again, it's, can we embrace this as all of us becoming better? And this is like an important journey is I think a, a mindset that I think is really important for people to have. I definitely agree. Um, well, our time is coming to a close and I don't want to keep you long because I know you probably have to change one or two of your hats for the rest of the afternoon. But I usually like to ask um, as we close, what are you looking forward to? Like it's, it's been it's still a rough, you know, this time last year when I was doing podcasts around COVID-19, I was thinking, you know, we were all thinking we were going to be on the other side of it sooner than now. But we're <laughs> we're still in it, unfortunately. But um, I think we see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. But what are you looking forward to or hopeful um, about as, as we kind of move through this interesting uh, segment in our history? I'm, there is a lot of opportunity in the maternal health space, which should also be women's health space because we are more than maternal. Yes. I just got to say that. Say I'm it again there. for the people in the back. Say it again. I am more than my uterus <laughs> and I matter more than just because I have two children, right? And I mattered. And if I had, you know, oh, we, I, I really love to get us all of the money before maternal, but I'm working on that. That's I'm working, so I'm working on that and hoping to get some traction in that space this year. This is one of my prime goals for 2021. But I am excited because there's energy, but I think that as we're, we, we've, we're the, the we're starting to get more organized. I'm excited because I see predominantly white organizations coming together, really ready to have these conversations about what does allyship really look like. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited about the community voice that's emerging and the solutions that are coming from community. Um, and I'm hoping we're moving to a place where we can have imagination about what can be. Um, and. I am hopeful that maybe we've got some policy space to finally um, make some change. So that's what I'm, I'm hopeful for. It feels like in this particular space and time, I have a lot of hope that we can actually push forward for big change. And also, I really like being able to hug my friends. <laughs> <laughs> be in person with my colleagues. These are also joyful things that I'm excited about. That is very true. I, I'm not the biggest hugger, but I will say I definitely miss hugging and people are getting more hugs than they used to get from me these days. So um, I am right there with you. But thank you so much. This was a pleasure. I learned, um, always learn something new. So I appreciate you teaching me something uh, new and uh, giving us the time to talk today. Well, I so appreciate having this time with you and appreciate everyone that listened and hope that that they'll share back and we can continue the conversation and learning together. Definitely. Thank you for listening to Reese Powers Live. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or subscribe to our YouTube channel.